So next up is Chin Mei. He's an audio geek, a home brewer, a maker, podcast, co podcaster, and he's going to tell us about the current state of web audio and why we should be doing more of it. So um, let me first start with uh, something. So let's see if this works. Uh, if I have internet, it will work. All right, let's see. Um, that was a really quick demo. I'll, I'll come back to what I actually showed at the end of the talk. Um, but this talk, um, well, let's go to presentation mode. I'm just going to hold this. I think for it to get easier. Um, well, so this is a talk uh, on web audio, an emerging platform for audio applications. My name is Chinmay. I work mostly with audio technologies, and I've been working a lot with web audio for the last couple of years. So I'm going to talk about what uh, web audio is, or how to make noise on the web. Um, the agenda for today's talk is quite simple. I'll first start talking about what is web audio, uh, why it matters, and how you can use web audio. Um, so let's first start with what is web audio. Uh, web audio is a browser API. Uh, it's one of the HTML5 family of APIs. It's a web standard. Uh, and that basic idea of web audio is to let you create, manipulate, and output audio in your browser. Um, so let's go back to a little bit of history. Um, does anybody remember this, BG Sound? So BG Sound was the only way to do any kind of audio uh, back in the IE days. This was a Microsoft-made uh, standard like some of the early XML HTTP request stuff, and it totally did not work. You could barely do anything with this. Uh, and then uh, everybody's beloved object and embed tags came around. Anybody use these? Uh, of course, that, that meant Flash. Uh, and this is a quick uh, Flash audio player. I hope it works. Um, but just like Flash, you never know. Oh, I think it'll go. Oh, yeah, there you go. So you could play, uh, flash, you could play audio uh, through Flash using the object and embed tags. But as always, it was Flash. It was crappy. People didn't like plugins. It was just a mess. Um, so the HTML standards came up with the audio tag, uh, which let you have a small little player. This is a native player, so you can basically play this straight up. Um, let's see how it works. Uh, not the, the prettiest UI, but you could play audio without needing any plugins, and that was great. Um, that meant you could do some websites. Uh, there's, a, there's an audio object in JavaScript that accompanies this tag, and it works the same way. Unfortunately, this tag only lets you play audio, play it faster, play it slower, uh, play it louder, or play it softer. There was no real uh, ability to control the audio. You couldn't filter things. You couldn't, you couldn't schedule things. Uh, so that was sort of um, limited. Um, so Firefox basically came up with this idea of uh, an audio data API. The idea would be that you could produce any kind of audio samples and just give it to Firefox, and uh, Firefox would output, that, output it for them. Uh, it was sort of an early experiment that kind of worked, but um, didn't work out in the end. Uh, it was basically too slow to do anything interesting. And that's why uh, Firefox, along with everybody else, basically came up with a new HTML standard called Web Audio. Uh, and it's now a standard in all browsers. And, and it works. Uh, and I will go through how it works. Uh, but it basically solves a lot of the problems that the earlier uh, audio ex experiments in the browser had. So the main philosophy behind the standard is they basically want you to be able to do mixing, processing, and filtering. In other words, they want to be able to do this, uh, this. Uh, and also have boing sound to this in your browser. That is the basic idea behind the API. Uh, you ask, uh, what, what is this spec about? And uh, this basically uh, is the W3C spec for web audio. The cool thing, I didn't know about this until I started following this, that all W3C specs are public. All their activity is public. And you can actually follow uh, any of the W3C specs and see what's going on. Uh, and re recently, they've been using GitHub to do all the spec work. So the Web Audio API, 
the API itself is on GitHub. You can edit things, you can change things. Uh, all the issues against the spec itself are raised as GitHub issues, so it's actually very usable. And you can go through, look at all the discussions, what people are saying. There are mailing lists, but uh, GitHub is used very more often. So if you're interested in what's going on uh, to, the, to the API, any API actually, uh, you should go check out uh, GitHub. Uh, the status of uh, web audio itself currently, uh, you can actually go to caniuse.com and look at this. Uh, it's 66% browser support, and mainly because none of the IEs supported it. Um, but nobody likes to program against IE anyway, so we, don't, we can ignore that. But ignoring IE, and, and, and actually do, do look that uh, Edge 12 and Edge 13 actually support web audio already. Uh, so if you ignore the, the first column, uh, everything else is more or less green. Uh, Opera Mini also nobody cares about, so uh, all the other ones actually support web audio, including, if you look at it, uh, the mobile browser. So web audio is supported on all mobile phones as of today, uh, including iPads and a bunch. Actually, it, it just says um, Chrome 34 and Chrome 44 for Android browser, but everything before. So if, even if you have older Chromes on Android or, or older versions of iOS, uh, that's still supported. Um, so what can you do with web audio? Uh, you can make musical instruments, you can make games, you can make immersive, interactive experiences. Uh, you can make uh, communication stuff, uh, you can make recordings, you can make digital audio workstations. Basically anything you can think of uh, in a browser. Uh, and then you'd ask, why would you want to do these in browsers? Why would you want to add audio stuff in a browser? Have we not had enough of annoying websites that open up with stupid music and just annoy the heck out of us? Um, I think there's some really interesting things you can do. Of course, you have to be a bit tasteful about it, but there are some really, really interesting things that you can do uh, on the web, um, especially with, uh, with audio. And I think the web platform has a lot of things to offer to audio applications. Uh, one of the most uh, cool things you can do is distribution, right? Uh, everything is just a URL. Uh, and if you can share URLs, you can do some really cool things. So this is an example. It's something called Animated Soundworks. It's an uh, it's, uh, audio uh, mo sound model. It's basically a way to create sound. So this one, uh, if I remember correctly, makes uh, motorcycle sounds. Uh, and you can change the kind of sound you're making so you can have it uh, faster. And you can see how bad it is. Uh, this is really bad, and this is not so bad. But the cool thing about this is, well, this is all uh, audio synthesis being done in the browser. But um, you can actually, for the chosen setting that I have, you can actually create a URL string, um, and then copy it, and then send it to someone else. And that string encodes uh, this setting. So if I close this site, uh, and I open a new one, and I put the same URL, I will get the exact same sound, uh, I hope. Right? So uh, this ability to share stuff with the URL is very powerful. And you can use it in a lot of really interesting concepts with audio, uh, like what I showed. Um, you can also do real-time stuff. You can do real-time control. You can do peer-to-peer -peer collaboration. There is a standard call of WebRTC that allows you to send audio across uh, the web. And because this is all native to the web, these things are really easy. The libraries to do this. Um, and there are already applications built on top of this. Soundtrap um, is a digital audio workstation. So if you ever use GarageBand or Logic, this is exactly the same thing, uh, but in your browser. Uh, so once it loads up, um, I can show you. You enter the studio. You can do basic things like tracking, uh, start tracking music. You can um, record using your microphone. You can uh, have instruments. You can have keyboards. The cool part is there's also a collaboration mode where you can invite a friend uh, who can live jam with you and record the whole session and then publish it, save it. So basically what you could do uh, a long time ago, and some of the stuff like the collaboration you couldn't even do uh, even in the more professional audio applications, you can do it online because the browser is natively uh, online. So let's leave this. Uh, and the last thing I, I think that's really cool is um, HTML and CSS and JavaScript uh, lend themselves to have very interactive uh, experiences. It's really easy to make interactive stuff in, in HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And if you tie audio with that, you can make some really, really cool interactive stuff. So here's a quick example of uh, uh, visual and audio combined together with interaction. So as you move your mouse, this little alien moves around. And if I have audio. Oh. Wow. 
So you can imagine these as part of games or as part of uh, these immersive experiences for advertising, for, for movies. So these can be really easily done uh, on the web. Uh, and that's why I think audio on the web is a really cool premise. And I'm really excited that it's actually happening. So that's a bit of like how uh, and wh why and what web audio is. So let's look at actually how it works, uh, the basics. The entire API is based on what is called a signal routing paradigm. So basically, you have these things, the, the, the boxes. They are called audio nodes. And you chain them up. And you connect one to the other one, connect another one to another one. At the end of the day, you connect it to something called the destination, which is basically the, the output of your, uh, of your laptop or your machine. And you get audio out of it. Uh, you can have very, very simple ones, like this one, where you just have a simple source to destination. Or you can have much more complex ones with filters and reverbs and all sorts of stuff. And that's, that's what the whole API is about, making graphs. Uh, the whole API is actually in JavaScript. So this is sort of how it will look like. Um, um, I won't go through the code, uh, but I'll highlight the important parts of it. Um, but don't worry, the actual audio processing in a lot of the things is done at a lower level in either C++ or in ESM. So performance is not an issue for the most common tasks. Uh, in this case, you see, uh, I think this is in, uh, from WebKit source code. This is the FFT module for, I think, the reverb effect or something. Um, and it's actually all done in C++. So it's really optimized. Uh, and in some cases, especially for uh, mobile devices, it's hand-coded assembly. So it's really, really optimized to be able to do what it needs to do, uh, especially if you use the native nodes. So we'll come to native nodes in a second. So everything, as you saw, was a chain of uh, a graph of nodes. And these nodes are what, um, uh, what matter. So there are two types of nodes. There are something called the native nodes, which are implemented in C++ and assembly in the browser. And then there's something called the JavaScript node, which is uh, like a black box, like an, a blank canvas. And you can implement your own processing uh, in, uh, in the JavaScript node. Um, so we'll look at the different types of nodes there are. There are source nodes, uh, which are basically a way to create audio. So there's an oscillator, there is a buffer source. An oscillator just creates a, a tone. Could be a sawtooth, could be square, could be sine tone. Uh, a buffer source basically allows you to uh, take an MP3 or any kind of an audio file and, and use that as a source. Uh, media element uh, is basically, it lets you use a video, uh, a video stream as a source. And then uh, a media stream is for using WebRTC and any kind of online streams as a source. There's a bunch of effects you can do. And again, these effects are all implemented natively. So you can do FFTs, delays, filters, convol con convolution, wave shaping, dynamics. Uh, a bunch of these are provided off uh, just by the API for you. So it's really useful. And then there's the destination, which is where you actually send the audio out to. So it could be a loudspeaker. You could do pre-rendering. So you could generate all of this beforehand and store in a buffer. Or you can push it out onto the network using media stream. The script processor is a special child. Um, this is what it actually gives you. It gives you a, a, a callback called onProcess. And whenever onProcess triggers, it gives you a, a buffer and tells you, uh, fill this buffer up uh, and give it back to me with any data you want. Uh, so you can imagine this is completely blank canvas. You can generate whatever you want. You can generate a simple sign tone. To, you can do all sorts of crazy processing uh, in this, in this uh, model. Uh, this is not the most performant way of doing things, but this is the most customizable way of doing things. So between all these native nodes and the JavaScript node, you have, you have a trade-off between uh, no, customizability as well as performance. So depending on what you want, you can choose uh, whichever uh, of the two types of nodes you want to use. Um, the way you actually connect these nodes is using a connect method. So every node has a dot .connect method. Here you see the buffer. Which, is, which I'm creating in the second line, getting connected in the third line. Got you, and you form a very simple connection where the buffer is connected to the destination. But of course, you, can, you, can't, you don't have to stop there. You can have much more complex graphs like this. This is from a vocoder that somebody had built. Uh, and actually, this is, I believe, one-tenth of the actual graph. I couldn't, have, I couldn't fit the whole thing on the screen. So it can get really, really complex. Uh, and then each, uh, to, the way to control all these nodes once you set them up in a graph is you have these things called parameters, which are handles to every node. So you can change them. Uh, in this, so some of the examples of parameters are on a filter node, you have a frequency, which tells you what frequency to cut off. On a gain node, you have the loudness. On, on uh, a buffer, you, can, uh, you have a parameter for playing it faster or slower. 
while just being able to change these parameters is really useful, there are some really powerful things that the API exposes for you, which is called parameter automation, which lets you change these values in synchrony with time. So if you want the frequency to increase at a specific rate or decrease at a specific rate, there are methods on these parameters, like set a linear ramp to value at time or set exponential, uh, exponential ramp to value at time, which let you do things like this. So this is a simple sine tone. It might be a bit loud. Uh, and you can ramp it up. And the rate at which it just ramps can be really controlled, and it's systematic. It's very synchronous, so it won't depend. Even if your JavaScript is being, uh, you know, the JavaScript thread is being uh, blocked, this will this will still ramp up at the exact same rate. And you can have a slow ramp down, for example. Right. So th these these things have yeah, boom. These things happen at a, uh, outside the normal JavaScript rendering thread, so you don't have to worry about synchronizing them with other things, right? Uh, similarly, you can, uh, so the other powerful thing you can do with parameters is you can actually connect nodes to parameters. Now, this might get a bit confusing, but if you look at the graph, um, the buffer source is going through the gain to the, to the destination, and the gain itself, the value of the gain is being controlled by oscillator. So you get this amplitude modulation kind of effect, so this is how it sounds like. And then you can change the frequency of the, the stuff in the buffer by changing this. Or you can change the carrier. And all these uh, handles are basically ca calling the, the, the change in the parameter values. Uh, similarly, you can do frequency modulation by changing the frequency. So this will. So, so these are really simple uh, concepts, and these are really sort of primitive things that the API exposes to you. But you can imagine like combining these in different scenarios, in different cases, you can actually build up some really, really powerful things. And that's exactly what a bunch of people have already done. So you don't have to use the API at a very low level. There's a bunch of really, really nice libraries that have already been built uh, by the community. The API is about three years old, so they've had a lot of time to abstract out some nice libraries. Tone.js is a really great library for doing sort of musical instruments kind of stuff. So if you want to make uh, any kind of website that has some sort of a musical instrument, you can use Tone.js. Um, Sonoport sound models are something that I created, which lets you do more of the interactive stuff. So if you remember the alien guy uh, that was moving around the screen, and, and sort of based on my interaction, it created different sounds. So the, the sound models uh, let you do that very easily. Uh, Babylon.js is a great uh, framework for making games. So if you're looking at games and if you want to add sounds to them with web audio, Babylon.js is a great framework for doing that. Uh, and all these are on GitHub. They're all open source. There's also a bunch of really cool tools people have written around web audio. Uh, one of my favorite is uh, Firefox. Firefox, especially the developer edition, has this thing called the web audio inspector. So all the code we saw till now, uh, when, you, when you write your, your sort of web audio code, it's really hard to imagine how it looks like. Uh, but this tool, let me show this to you. Uh, oh. uh, actually, lets you lets you see that. So uh, I'm going to exit my presentation and bring up Firefox. And this is a, a simple bird sound emulator that I made. So so this basically creates bird sounds from just pure mathematical algorithms and. If you look at, um, if you open up the inspector, uh, there's a really nice graph that it shows, and you can actually look at the values of the different um, the different nodes. Uh, it's a great debugging tool, so that's a really cool one. Um, there's Recorder JS, which is um, a, a nice library to let you record from your microphone. Um, so if you have access, uh, most of the I think Chrome, Safari, Sef uh, no, not Safari, Chrome, Firefox, and I uh, and Microsoft Edge support. Uh, input from a uh, microphone, so if that is supported, the recorder just lets you record that. Um, this is some other really cool tools, like uh, this one, which lets you make a nice UI. It's a drag and drop interface to make sort of use UI uh, inter interfaces for you know playing with audio, and then each of them you can actually write some code that generates uh, you know changes things. So if you want to have some handles, you know controllers to change your your musical instrument or whatever writing, uh, Braid lets you make user interfaces for doing that. Um, so these are some really cool tools that exist. Um, so I've been talking about um, web audio, uh, which has been something that I'm really excited about. But there's a sort of a companion spec that just came out. Uh, it, 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 
it has been being, uh, it was, it was, it's a spec that has been being standardized for the last um, couple of years, but very recently Chrome actually implemented it and put it into um, uh, Chrome without any flags, and it's called Web MIDI. It's, really, it's very related. Uh, and um, so before that, does everybody here know what is MIDI? Uh, anybody knows what's MIDI? Anybody, who doesn't know what's MIDI? So MIDI is this old protocol. It's actually older than me. Uh, it's, uh, it's call, it's call, uh, it stands for Musical in Instrument Digital Interface. Actually, nobody even calls it that. Everybody just calls it MIDI. It's an old uh, electrical protocol for uh, wiring up musical instruments. So basically, the idea was you could have a bunch of you know, synthesizers, filters, keyboards, and you could all make them all talk to each other using this one standard called MIDI. It's a very old serial protocol. It, it's actually very slow and very stupid. It doesn't do much. But because it's been around for so long, there are so many instruments that can talk MIDI today that this is a, the, that the, the web platform people basically decided that if we support that, then we, should, we would be able to use all these instruments that exist and control them from, you know, from your mobile phones, from your, from your laptops, or whatever. Uh, although the, the, the MIDI spec is old, there's a, a bunch of people who make sort of modern hardware. So this is USB control. It uh, goes into my USB port. Uh, that basically you control stuff. So this is just a bunch of sliders and knobs. Um, and this costs like $60. So you can get some really nice control um, hardware that you can control um, anything with. Um, so this is, a, this is all MIDI does is it sends you sort of control data. So it could be this slider is at this value, this slider is at that value. Um, and the way Web MIDI works is it exposes MIDI hardware to the browser. So all it does is basically whatever your OS can see, uh, uh, so this is OS X's uh, MIDI setup stuff, and, and I plug this guy in, and it, uh, OS X just sees this. It exposes that to the browser. So once this works, uh, the browser basically just shows me um, uh, the, the MIDI device itself. Uh, it works without any flag. With, it's not an experimental feature. It's actually production in Chrome. Uh, Firefox is working on it. Uh, of course, Safari hasn't talked about it at all. But, um, and then uh, Edge is working on it as well. So this is how it works. It's really simple. I'm going to try to see if I can show you the messages. Um, sure, my this guy has not been working since yesterday. Let's see. Oh, there you go. So um, this is a UI I quickly made up to show you the kind of messages I'm showing. So it's a three. Uh, it's a triplet. The first one shows um, um, the control. It, it, that's a type of control message. The second one is a channel. So different channel has uh, this is 16, this is 17, and the third one is the value of my slider. So it's really simple, doesn't do much, and the actual API itself is very, very simple. It just throws a, uh, throws a MIDI input event uh, on MIDI message, and you just parse the event. That's all it is. Um, it's, it's, uh, the, the spec is actually quite um, small, and it's actually already verified. Uh, unfortunately, the browser support is really shit right now. It's just Chrome. Uh, and Chrome on Android, though, which is pretty cool. So you can imagine uh, with a US, one of those uh, MUSB cables, you could actually hook up any of these guys to your Android phone and they will still work. Um, so I'm going to end off with a bunch of demos um, uh, and what people have done with Web Audio. So the first one is an acid machine. Uh, I think you guys would probably like this. You know, we would, we would love to have your fast JavaScript loading right now. So I'm going to randomize some stuff and I'm going to So this is all again completely done in JavaScript. So if you know, you could, you could imagine this is a very simple demo, but you can imagine like a full-on DJ application that you could you could get you know to work with some MIDI devices um, and and you know make all all sorts of music you want. Um, this was a really cool thing that I uh, I saw at a uh, a conference on Web Audio, uh, which uh, hooks up to an archive of bird sound recordings from all over the world, and then it finds the one closest to you. So it's going to try to find the one closest to whatever this geolocation gives me, which is not bad. It actually got some in McRitchie and Fort Canning. And then it sort of um, makes an abstract soundscape based on all these bird sound recordings. So some of them are still being loaded. And so they mix and, and, and sort of um, uh, merge all these sound recordings based on, on the, the location. Okay, 
Uh, this was a really cool one. This is a, this is a, a really wacky uh, sound synthesizer which uh, uses the video camera uh, to detect my emotion and then based, based on that makes a music. <laughs> I know, right? This is something I saw yesterday. Uh, uh, this is going to be a bit of a pain to start. Let's let's try. So one of the issues is uh, everything in audio, uh, web audio runs in this thing called the web audio context. Uh, and there is a finite number of contexts you can use. And uh, after that, Chrome basically starts, says no more. Uh, unfortunately, the way tabs work in Chrome, they sometimes they share context. And that's the issue it has. But anyway, this is like a... Um, Conway's Game of Life. Uh, so I can draw some patterns for starting. I don't know why it stops at this square thing. And you can also change some of the tones of the sounds in the filter at the bottom. So you can choose. Uh, and the last one uh, was what I started with, which is um, a Carpus Strong uh, algorithm implementation. So Carpus Strong is a famous um, synthesis algorithm. It's completely it uses mathematics to generate string sounds, and I've hooked it up such that um, uh, it's actually mapped to my keyboard, so I can make single uh, uh, string sounds. And this is not sampled, so this is not a recording. This is completely generated in uh, using uh, an algorithm. And then there's a bunch of um, okay. Let's see if this works. There's a bunch of controls that it exposes that I have mapped to my MIDI controller. If my, let me try to re-plug in my MIDI controller. So I can I can play the, the individual keys and this is um, this is just a quick diagram for me to remember what keys are what and uh, then I can change the, the tension of the string so that when I change the tension it's going to sound different or I can change the character so. Or damping. Of course, I'm a really shitty musician, so I have a synthesizer, I have a sequencer to make sure it sounds nice. <laughs> Let's try one more time. There you go. Okay. Um, so now that's that's all I had the content for for the talk. So please go and make some noise. Know that this is a very easy way to do it, and uh, everything works. Most of the stuff works in all browsers that all of us use today. Uh, so go ahead and make some noise, and if you have any questions, uh, the, all my slides, all the demos, uh, everything is on this website. You can follow me on Twitter and ask me questions on that. Uh, actually, all the slides are also on GitHub, so if you want to look at the source or any of that stuff, it's all there. Uh, so any questions? So, so the source of all is uh, no, so the last, the one I was showing you, Castro, which I made, it's actually not, there's no source. It's all uh, mathematically generated. So, when you talk about saving data using APIs, any other application that uses XML authorization, does it create something using one of the tools, and can you say it? There are some, um, yeah, so there, there have been sort of standardization efforts around um, sort of musical data. Uh, I just saw very recently, I don't remember the name of the project, I can, I can tell you later, I, or I can tweet it out. 
Uh, there are people trying to standardize it using the newer formats, because a lot of these were really old. So there's, I don't know, there's something called Music XML, which is really old and verbose. But there's like JSON-based ones that are coming up. Uh, so there are efforts to do that, uh, although it's not widespread yet. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I think MIDI has been a MIDI. So MIDI, a, along with the control format, is also a file format, and that's been that has been historically the most common way to move stuff around. Uh, and there are people trying to sort of write libraries to to, um, to to basically parse MIDI files and then use them. So, yeah. how, how high quality is uh, Singapore? Uh, so it's mostly done at 16-bit uh, uh, 44.1. Although, uh, I believe the audio context actually runs at whatever sound card you have. So if your OS supports higher uh, 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 sampling rates, uh, it will actually let you do it at whatever sampling rate that your OS supports. But I'm doing all my stuff at 16-bit yeah, 44. Uh, that depends on whatever your OS and whatever sound card you have, right? So. Uh, how the, latency the latency is actually quite slow, uh, quite low. Uh, it adds a little bit over what the OS gives you. So, uh, and OS then is historically known to have really low latency already. So, uh, also it depends on the browsers a little bit. Like, um, I believe Safari has slightly better latency numbers than uh, Chrome does, but it's it's pretty good. Although on mobile, there's a big issue because of the actual screen latencies, not so much as audio latencies. Uh, for internal processing, does it still use 16-bit integers? Uh, I don't think so. I think internal processing, it uses uh, whatever the JavaScript number format thingy, uh, which is a float. Yeah. And there are actually some issues with that uh, as well, with uh, denormalizing them. Uh, you, you can look it up. Uh, there, there, there's a bunch of issues on that on the GitHub spec if you're interested in figuring out what exactly it does internally with the, with the numbers. I'm sorry, we can't have any more questions. If you talk, want to talk to Chinmay, find him outside, tweet at him, pummel him with the sledgehammer. Can, can I make a last quick uh, announcement? Go ahead. Um, I'm running a, a couple of events at DevFest Asia. Uh, one is a Node School, which is a, a, a way to learn, uh, self learn JavaScript and stuff. Uh, and there's a web audio track for that. And there's also a web audio hack day uh, on 21st of November. Go check out DevFest.Asia for more. Uh, and if you're interested in this stuff, come down. I think it's going to be really fun. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. <laughs>